So let's begin with a short invocation. You can try to repeat after me. Namo. Bhagavate. Vasudevaya Vasudevaya So Vasudev refers to the all-pervading divinity. So this is an invocation that we invoke the divinity within us to guide us towards light and love. Once more. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Vasudevaya One last time. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Vasudevaya Thank you for coming today evening. My name is Chaitanya Charan or simply for short Charan. My friends call me CC. <laughs> so So, I'm based in India and I travel across the world trying to understand and share the wisdom of Bhakti Yoga. And I've been doing this for the last two and a half decades. Previously, I studied my engineering. I had a very strong scientific bent of mind. And I was pleasantly surprised when I discovered how yoga had so much rational and practical dimension to it. So, I'll talk today about discovering our purpose. And I'll talk about this in three parts. First is why purpose matters. Then second is that we'll talk about two kinds of purposes. There is a universal and an individual. And then I'll talk about how we can progress towards discovering our purpose. But why purpose matters. Mm -hmm. Then two kinds of purposes. And then we'll talk about three principles for moving towards our purpose. So I would like to begin by asking you, how many of you think that purpose matters? Okay. How many of you think this question matters? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the question about purpose. So, okay. Let's look. Why do you think purpose matters? Why is purpose important? Any thoughts? It gives you direction. Yes. It gives us direction. Life can itself be confusing, bewildering. Life can pull us in different directions and purpose gives us, okay, this is where I want to go. Yeah, that's one thing. Anything else? It gives us drive and meaning. Okay. So it's not just direction, but drive means the energy to move in that direction. And why am I moving? It gives us meaning. True. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, you could say, meaning also gives us fulfillment. Joy. Yeah, fulfillment and joy. It's generally when we have progressed towards something worthwhile, that's when we get a sense of fulfillment. Any other thoughts? 
usually good for the community. Yes, purpose, you could say, enables us to make a contribution, to do some service to the community, to do some good for others. So, good for others, for the community at large. True. So, thank you. At one level, we could say that we humans are in are an somewhat anomalous in existence. Now, all living beings, they are biologically designed to survive. Hmm? The struggle for survival characterizes existence. And all life, there is a struggle for survival. And while this is certainly there within humans also, mm -hmm. but we humans seem to exhibit something opposite at times. That is, while most of us struggle to survive, some people sometimes end their existence. It is, while we all fight for our life, some people just give up and then they end their lives. Now, it's, it's ironic because in general observation, no species other than the human species commits intentional suicide. Sometimes one sheep may go off a, go off a cliff and others may follow in a herd mentality. They're not exactly planning to end their lives, just doing what somebody else does. Now, sometimes if a pet is a pet and a master have a very close relationship, then if the master passes away or the master leaves, the pet may just uh, wither away and die. That can happen at times. But again, that's not exactly suicide. So why is it that while we humans, we we, like other living beings, we strive for existence, we strive for survival, but at the same time, sometimes we end up wanting to end our existence itself. That's, well, there could be various, I'm not here talking about suicide, there could be many reasons for that, it's a complex sociological phenomenon, but in general, in principle, human, living beings other than humans, they are broadly satisfied with survival. That we all have four biological drives. We need food, we need safety, we need uh, we living beings, we means all living beings, reproduction, and then there is rest. So these are common drives for all living beings. A cow can eat grass day after day, month after month, year after year. We humans, if we are told to eat the same food for one week, we we'll get bored. Basically, what happens is that if you consider our biology or in general, biology itself gives some pleasure. Eating gives some pleasure, mating gives some pleasure fighting and winning gives some pleasure. And if when we are tired resting, if not pleasure, at least it gives some relief. We feel good if we get good rest. So these is fulfillment of our biological drives gives some pleasure. But we humans innately want something more than what our biology offers. And it is because of this wanting more than what our biology offers that we try to improve on the biologically driven pleasures. That's why I say we have hundreds and thousands of cuisines and hundreds of cuisines and maybe thousands of items within various cuisines. Biology gives us the pleasure of eating, but we want more pleasure, not just a simple pleasure of eating. So essentially you could say, if this is our biology, there is, that means basically you could say that's our body, physical side. There is something beyond it and that something, it seeks pleasure through the body, but it seeks 
more pleasure than the what the body naturally offers more pleasure than what the body offers and conversely when this pleasure doesn't come about we feel far greater pain this points towards something deeper that we humans we are actually meant for something more than just survival we certainly food is a necessity sleep is a necessity reproduction is a necessity without which human race wouldn't survive but we look for something more than that through the biology and satisfying its drives so that itself is a pointer that we in one cells we don't want we just don't want pleasure we want meaningful pleasure how many of you like humor you know if somebody said i don't like humor you say what's wrong with you <laughs> who does it like to laugh you know if they really <laughs> <laughs> thank you for making us laugh <laughs> so but if somebody told us say that okay from tomorrow morning onwards you know you have no financial obligations no family ob obligations no social obligations no health obligations by some magical arrangement you don't have to do anything from morning to night for the rest of your life just watch comedy shows and laugh you know would you enjoy that yeah maybe for a few hours if you are very if you are very fed up with things maybe for a weekend after some time you say that even if the comedy is good mm -hmm. still you'll get tired of laughing <laughs> because that just laughing it's meaningless pleasure the pleasure is there but it lacks any meaning and we just are not satisfied with that it's this kind of pleasure it's at all one level a little titillation and titillation is in some ways like tickling <laughs> you know <laughs> if somebody tickles us especially in the parts where we are sensitive we may laugh now normally laughter is pleasure but is the laughter from tick tickling pleasure well you can say one kind of pleasure isn't it but if you want to have a serious discussion and other person starts tickling us you stop i want to have a talk something serious stop it so if tickling itself were happiness then we could just try to have science invent a perpetual tickling machine and keep tickling us for the rest of our life and we would be happy no that doesn't work see we want pleasure but we want not just pleasure but meaningful pleasure and i started by talking about the striking difference between humans and non humans that is in one sense as far as ethologists those who study animals in their natural habitat have observed animals don't really ponder the meaning and purpose of their existence or at least they don't do it as much as we humans do or can do we seek meaning and when that meaning is lacking or when we are robbed of that meaning then we start feeling what is the point even of living and that's why you we could say that if we consider our needs at one level survival is a basic need if somebody doesn't have food then they'll be desperate for food so about survival you could say pleasure is another need we don't want just to go through life with a long face and a heavy heart we want pleasure but beyond that we need meaning in life and while at one level this is progressive we really can't think much about meaning of life if we don't even have if we're not even surviving one level if i'm desperately hungry 
I won't really think much about the taste of the food. I just want food, whatever food it is. So the pleasure comes secondary. So in one sense, these are incremental needs. But at another level, the need for meaning is so important that if that is lost, then a person may even think, what is the point even of living? And that is the time when people may end their lives. So somebody may, a specific cause, somebody ends their life might be, you know, maybe they invested their life in a business and the business went down. They, they invested themselves too, a lot in a relationship and the relationship broke apart. I come from India, which is a very education conscious country. So it's tragic that in some of the top universities in India, and when students don't do well in an exam, they end their life at that time. Now, what has happened over there? Why, why would somebody end their life because they didn't do well in an exam? It's not just because they got poor grades. It's because of the meaning that they give to those poor grades. So basically, this was about our needs, the progressive. But now, when we, we all will face failure. So, the meaning we give to failure, loss, reversal, distress, what meaning do we give to it? Say, for example, we try to succeed in an exam. We try to, is this word used in India? Yes. Crack an, in Australia, crack an exam. Do you use that? That a crack means pass with flying colors. Mm, that's some of the peculiar Indian usage. Sometimes you try to crack an exam, but the exam cracks you. <laughs> End up doing very poorly. So the thought at that time is, I have lost. And that's a fair enough assessment. Everybody loses in life at times. Now, a far more damaging, if you consider this in terms of degeneration, I am lost. That is even more damaging. I am lost means it's I, I don't have any direction. But this is much closer to home. It hurts. You know, sometimes we are some we are maybe shaving our head or we are cutting. If somebody is doing some surgery or you cut close to a nerve, it hurts more. The closer it cuts to the nerve, so this is coming closer to the nerve. I am lost. But the most damaging meaning. That somebody might give to failure is, I am a loser. Now, when somebody gives that meaning to failure, nobody wants to be a loser. And that may make that person do something extreme. So, it's not just the event, the meaning that they give to the event. So, if a person loses something, and they have identified themselves too strongly with that. Then they feel that this is not just an event in my life. This becomes their self-definition. So, I was talking earlier about meaning. So, we, we seek meaning in life. And where we seek meaning, we all, based on our upbringing, our worldview, our way of looking at things, we invest different things with meaning to different degrees. And when we invest those things with the meaning, if that is lost to the greater, to the extent we have invested meaning in that event, to that extent we are shocked, we are aghast. Uh, right now in cricket, there is the World Cup that is going to start in India. Is there some World Cup fever? Is World Cup, cricket big in Australia? Somewhat big. Okay. So anyway, India, there's a lot of World Cup fever. So I was in Canada at one time and I was speaking about a similar theme. And there one person came. He said he was from Sri Lanka and he was a big cricket fan. And between 2010 to around 2015, Sri Lanka got in something like three or four big tournament finals and each final they lost. So at that time, he said that you know, we were very disappointed. And one of my friends, he said, at that time, when the Sri Lanka lost in the final for the third time, says this friend committed suicide. Just that really shook me up. What's going on over here? See, none of the Sri Lankan players committed suicide, but a fan committed suicide. 
for the players yeah it's a job it's a it's a matter of national pride but after all it's a match you win you lose but the fans invested themselves so much if my country lost in a cricket match what is the point of my living so our need for meaning is very great and we all may invest that invest different things with different degrees of meaning and if that thing gets shaken we may be lost so at one level if somebody lacks food and they suffer and they are in pain we understand that but sometimes you know we have invested a lot of meaning in something and then something goes wrong over there and we are very disturbed and then somebody else says no cool down calm down first we are disturbed and then we are disturbed why they are not disturbed do you understand how serious this is and it it comes why because the two people have very different understandings of what is meaningful so somebody will say oh, why commit suicide just because your team lost a match but that's their meaning is invested so that's why understanding where we have invested meaning is extremely important for us so in the in the search for meaning we are talking about purpose and i'll shortly talk about the relationship between meaning and purpose but search for meaning is there are two possibilities one is it goes nowhere that means a person does not have anything meaningful in their life then actually their life becomes extremely pointless what am i even living for today i exist tomorrow i don't exist is it going to make any difference to anything to anyone if not then what is the point even of living so if we don't find meaning anywhere if we don't invest anything with meaning then our existence can become pointless but on the other hand if we consider a pendulum we invest anything it meaning randomly okay i take this sometimes some kids nowadays with social media tiktok and other things going on uh there are for some kids the idea that how many views my post gets on tiktok that is the source of meaning in their life and there's some horrific social media challenges and games where somebody films themselves maybe taking poison or doing something toxic and that gets a lot of views and they die in the process but i got a lot of views so if somebody invests meaning in things without much discernment without much thought you know that can be reckless so not having any meaning anywhere can be pointless but unthinkingly mistaking meaning putting meaning anything that can make us reckless that can make us do dangerous things things that hurt others things that hurt ourselves so we need to we need to invest this the search for meaning needs to be we could say constructively directed wisely directed this does not mean that everybody will find meaning in only one thing they are individuals but we have to direct the search for meaning constructively so now i just if this is the first point i was talking why purpose matters so purpose and meaning they are closely related and sometimes they two go to i want meaning and purpose in my life so now they are very closely related but meaning is more about making sense of things what is of value what matters what is important when you make sense of things okay if you come into this room right now hey what's going on there okay maybe there's a talk going on over here okay let me i'm not interested i'll go out my right? interest is i stay over here in life we need to make sense of things and purpose is more about making sense in things what is the difference between off and in over here in is more about what am i going to do about it what is my role in this so basically we want the world to make some kind of sense 
or at least our corner of the world to make some kind of sense and within that we want that there should be some role for me so things make sense and within that i can make some sense so purpose is more about a sense of agency hmm? meaning is associate more with value what is of value to me purpose is okay what am i doing in this so for example if we see come to a place so suppose there's a firefighter and a person is called and they go to a place hey this fire over here okay what am i to do now they would like to make sense of things okay what caused this fire was it explosives do we need to be care ready to immediately run away from here if it explodes was it arson you know is there any other inflammable material close by over here are there any civilians no, we, they would like to make sense of things but sometimes just there is no time or a pause to make sense of things so you can't find meaning okay what caused this but if you can't okay make sense in things okay this fire is here you know we have some civil we have some people staying over there that that is made of food maybe that burns it will catastrophe so it's we had to attack the fire from that side we'll stop it over there so sometimes even if we can't make sense of things we can make sense in things i hope i'm making this difference clear so so when we want to find meaning okay why did this happen that is like the bigger picture that's meaning so generally when i said value what it means is in terms of cause effect connection we are able to say okay this will lead to this this will lead to this therefore this is more important this is not that important that's meaning but making sense in things means that what can i do about it so while meaning and purpose both are important we can't always have meaning in our life because in the sense that we can't always make sense of why things happen but we can always have purpose in our life when something happens okay what what do i do about it that is something i can ask and i can do something about it but why did this happen what's going on over here that may be much more difficult to figure out so per so i talked about you could say that in this hierarchy meaning is there but even above meaning is purpose so if we have a sense of direction if we have a sense of agency even amid chaos we can be making some positive difference so now when we talk about meaning and purpose as that was the first point i saw i'll discuss the second point i said is there are two to broadly two kinds of purposes one is the universal and the second is personal now what do i mean by universal and per personal that is there i may think what is the purpose of my life okay i want to be an artist i want to be a singer i want to be this i want to be that that is the purpose of my life and that's great if we have a sense of purpose for our life but within the broader framework of the world does existence itself have a purpose is is purpose something which i give to myself within this chaotic world or is is existence itself moving purposefully and when things happen are they just moving happening randomly or are they moving in some direction this the world spiritual traditions say that we live in an interconnected universe the yoga the word yoga itself means connection or harmony that again has this idea that all of us are parts of something bigger than ourselves and although we may not be able to see for ourselves how the universe is moving purposefully but the universe is moving in a direction that direction is ultimately meant for raising human consciousness the world the way the universe is structured is to help us all evolve to help us learn and grow so within this 
evolution of human consciousness. So when things happen, the, they have a purpose. So it's like, suppose, okay, you have to imagine that I, I'm an artist and this is a bird. Well, that's not a bird. <laughs> Okay, I just write a word. <laughs> okay, so imagine a bird is in a shell. Hmm? It's a baby bird, not just a bird. <laughs> That's even more difficult to draw. <laughs> so there's a baby bird in a shell, and now at one level, the shell is safe. <clears throat> but another level, the shell is constricting and as the baby bird keeps growing inside it, the shell starts hurting it. But when it pushes, the shell is tough, it's tight. I was on a farm in Florida, I had gone for a walk with a friend and I saw actually a shell and the bird inside trying to crack it open struggling and you're watching and finally the bird inside cracks and maybe a leg comes out and as leg comes out of the crack the shell snaps back again you can feel the bird wincing at the sharp edges of the shell pierce into its legs as they pierce at that time again it, it, it all that winces it struggles inside but then again it starts pushing it keeps pushing keeps pushing. Now, if the shell were softer, the baby bird could come out very easily. And at that point, the baby bird may think, why is this shell so hard? I could have come out so easily out of it. But, so from, from the baby bird's perspective, the bird's perspective, the sh there is a, there is a immediate purpose. And the immediate or the purpose is just come out of the shell. Hmm? Come out. But from nature's purpose, nature's perspective, there is a bigger purpose. The bird may come out of the shell. But if it comes out of the shell too early, it may be able to walk out, but it may not be strong enough to carry its own bodily weight and fly. So when it struggles inside, it's painful. But through all that struggle, it's growing. And as it is growing, eventually when it breaks out, it is not only able to have the freedom of walking outside the shell, it has the freedom of flying in the sky. So fly, that is the bigger purpose. So similarly for all of us, we all have certain shells around us where we think we all that our shell is our conception. Our shell is our conception of our purpose, of our meaning in life, whatever it is. Okay, you know, the purpose of my life is to become wealthy, it is to become popular, it is to do this, it is to do that. Mm -hmm. So, nowadays with social media, for many people, their idea is, I want to become an influencer. Okay, if you can influence people positively, that's great. But ultimately, we, we all have certain ideas of what we think our purpose is. And sometimes, we are in a situation where we feel my purpose is not being fulfilled. No, I'm not able to do this. Almost everyone in life feels undervalued, underrecognized, underappreciated. But when we have this sense that my circumstances are confining me, they are like a shell, and we want to break out. The only if these circumstances change, things would be so much better. Only if people valued me more. Or maybe the economy became better, or maybe this thing became this way. So yes, the circumstance changing could make things better. But there is a higher purpose to life. That ultimately the world moves as per a higher plan. 
So the divine, just like nature wants the bird to fly, the divine wants us not just to come out of our current and find shells, it wants us to evolve, to grow, to learn more, to grow in insight, to grow in our capacity to love, to grow in wisdom. And in that sense, sometimes the frustrations that we face, the setbacks that we face, they are meant to find, to help us find a deeper and a bigger purpose. So if we have a small purpose, then if it fails, it just becomes a blockage for us. But uh, So the bird has a small purpose, I want to come out and we say, I can't come out, this is too thick, this is too thick and too, too strong, but it keeps pushing, keeps pushing. It is fulfilling its small purpose, but in the struggle to fulfill the small purpose, it actually ends up fulfilling a bigger purpose, fulfilling a bigger purpose also. So similarly for us, we may, our individual purpose is that, okay, I want to come out of my current shell, whatever it might be. But the universal purpose is, the bigger purpose is, we are meant to grow, we are meant to evolve. And both these purposes can sometimes go together. In the case of the shell, the, the shell serves both the purposes at the same time. So this way, when we are faced with difficulties, generally the question of meaning comes, like I said, somebody may invest meaning, oh, I wanted to get good marks in this exam, I didn't get them, let me end my life. But that shell, they couldn't break through, okay, what is the point of living? No, but when life seems to take away whatever is meaningful for us, that is the time for us to look for a deeper meaning. Understand that there is a bigger and deeper meaning within us. So, put it another way, see we have plan and purpose. So what happens is sometimes we have a plan, this is how my life should look like. And when the plan doesn't work, we just become too discouraged. But our plans may not work. But that does not mean we have been, our purpose has been taken away from us. So we, we can hold, hold your plans lightly. Hold your purpose tightly. But sometimes what we do is, we hold our plans tightly. And when the plan doesn't work, we just give up our purpose itself. Nothing is going to work. No, this particular plan didn't work. So plan is more like a road. Whereas purpose is more like a direction. If you're coming to Krishna village, okay, you might plan, okay, I'll come by this road. It will get me from maybe Brisbane in one hour, maybe two hours. But then you're coming along, you say, maybe there's a traffic situation, it's going to take three hours. Oh, I don't have so much time. I'll just not go. Or, okay, let's find some other way. Is there some other way? So, in general for us, if we fixate too much on our, our immediate purpose, that may not seem to be working, we'll become disheartened. If you understand there's a bigger purpose, let me try to stick to that. And that brings me to the last part of how does bhakti wisdom help us make sense of our purpose in life. Hmm. So here, I said the universe, the Gita, the yoga text like the Bhagavad Gita explained that the universe does move meaningfully. So we could say above all of us is the divine. In our tradition, we know the divine by the name Krishna. So for all of us, we are all given certain gifts by the divine. We may have some abilities, some interests, some resources. Generally, our gifts, the gifts from the divine come in three forms. Abilities, some of us may have musical ability, some of us may have linguistic ability. It can come in the form of interests. There are, in the, in the world around us, we all naturally drawn to certain things. Nowadays, the idea is you can do whatever you want. Well, it's not that simple. It's like you look around the world and see what are the things you are drawn to. And within the things you are naturally drawn to, find out how we can contribute, what we can pursue. So we all have certain natural interests. Some people are just attracted a lot to say, 
art others are not attracted so within our natural our natural interests are also gifts and then the last is resources our resources could be we could be born in a country where there is a reasonable natural prosperity there is good law and order we could born in a family which is supportive we are born in the community whatever so these three they are like the air a i r abilities interests and resources so what the bhakti wisdom tells us is that what we have is god's gift to us and what we do with what we have is our gift to the divine and in this way life becomes a cycle of love so what we have is the divine's gift to us that gift is given out of love and what we do with what we have is our gift to the divine so it is whatever place we are in the world in our particular life this is a way we can link we can find meaning in our life we may feel okay you know i i'm in this particular society or this particular group and i don't have this ability and i don't have that i don't have that there so many reasons we can look we feel oh i am deficient i am inferior i am insecure but nobody can say that i don't have anything at all the gita says swa karmana tam abhyarcha by whatever is the work that you are attracted to naturally you are endowed with naturally contribute in this way you can link with the divine so in this way life becomes a cycle of love and bhakti yoga is a process by which we can both uncover and unleash our gifts so how does this happen i'll conclude with that point now so if this is the spiritual level of reality this is the material level of reality this is where we are presently existing and say we are here now and the divine is at the spiritual level of reality so at one level bhakti yoga is about connecting with the divine that is immersive bhakti so we turn away from the world and immerse ourselves in the divine this could be through meditation through mantra chanting through prayer through turning away from the world to connect with our soul and connect with the whole of whom our soul is a part so this itself gives us a sense of stability a sense of security because there is something unchanging beyond this world and we need regularly this kind of immersion in the divine but that's not all that is there to devotion devotion because a more inclusive understanding is that the divine doesn't just exist at the spiritual level the divine exists everywhere the divine exists in nature the divine exists in the human heart divine exists in all living beings so there is another aspect of bhakti which is we turn toward the world and this is inclusive bhakti that means the world is also included in our domain of service in our domain of devotion so we turn inward to find a connection a connection that will bring stability and then we turn outward to make a contribution how can i make a positive difference so immersive bhakti gives us connection and inclusive bhakti enables us to do contribution and if we have these two things connection and contribution then we'll find that our life will become filled with meaning slowly surely incrementally so what happens when this how this works connection and contribution while these two go together but they are also synergistic so when we have that connection through devotion 
So every morning if we wake up, we have some time for connecting with ourselves, for our spiritual practices, for going deep within ourselves. Then that, that connection gives us stability, a sense of there is an unchanging, a sense of there is something foundationally right in my life. I am connected with the whole. And with that mood, when we function, we act in the mood of service, we act in the mood of contribution, in our jobs, in our families, in our social circles, we'll find that we will be able to make a positive difference. Sometimes a small, big difference, sometimes a small difference, but nonetheless a difference. And when this happens, when we see we are able to make a better contribution, you know, that will give us energy. This thing, if I go inward, actually I can go outward better. And I see that I am able to do things better outward, then I want to go inward more. So in that way, both that combination of stability and energy can help us to do justice to our potentials. So, and gradually, our purpose, whatever it is specifically, that is something which we reveal to us from within and we'll march towards it. It may not be like a one moment, dramatic, life-changing revelation. It can just be a gradual orientation of our life and heart. And this is what I'm meant to do. So rather than fixating on one particular career or one particular relationship or one particular vocation, we understand the broader principle that our purpose centers on connection and contribution. And once we have that foundation set, then we can find our individual purposes. And as we go through life, sometimes our specific purposes in different stages of life can be different. You know, maybe in our youth, our driving purpose might be one thing. As we become older, maybe it could be different. So life is dynamic. If we have this foundation of connection and contribution, set for us, then we can adapt and focus on the purpose that is important for us. You know, if somebody has, say, somebody is young, they might, their initial purpose might be, I want to make an impact, I want to make it big in life. Maybe they get married, they have children, then their focus might be more, I want to take care of my children presently. And maybe for some time the career takes a back step, then children grow up, they have their own life, then they may think that, okay, now, there's something more I have learned through my life. Now my purpose might be something different. So with the wisdom that I have, the experience I have. So we will be able to adapt according to what calls our heart at different times. If we, our heart is grounded in the ethos of connection and contribution. So I'll summarize what I discussed today. Three main points. I started talk, talk, talking about how there is this country in YouTube. Humans, we tend to self-destruct. We alone self-destruct along among all species. And that is why, the one reason is that in the hierarchy of needs for us, survival is foundational, pleasure is secondary, pleasure is second, non is secondary, then is meaning, but beyond is purpose. So sometimes if we can't find meaning or purpose, then we might take our own life because life seems pointless. And why does this happen? Because we may invest. Meaning will be sometimes nowhere. When we are looking for meaning, it could be nowhere or it could be anywhere. And what we need is it needs to be wisely directed. So then we will have a sense of direction agency in our life. So how do we find this purpose? For that, I talked about the point of purpose being twofold. There is a universal purpose and then there is a personal purpose. So we all may have our purpose and sometimes it may seem to be working and sometimes it may not be working. So the personal purpose is, for example, the bird break the shell. Just come out of the shell. That's the purpose. But the universal purpose in that case is learn to fly. 
So if we understand that that universal purpose is always there for our life, even if an immediate purpose, our personal purpose is getting frustrated, we won't take it too seriously, we won't get too shattered or discouraged by that. Okay, let me push on. Let's see how things work out. Maybe the setback that I'm facing right now will help me to find some bigger purpose and go down to a deeper meaning. That's why even if we can't find Even if we can't make sense of life, we can make sense in life. I can't figure out why things are happening, but I can keep pushing onwards. I can keep doing my part. There will be some higher purpose. Like a firefighter may not be able to find out what caused the fire, but at least I can prevent the fire from spreading. And that brought us to the last part when I talked about. If we, are, what is this idea of universal purpose? It is that life is actually a reciprocation of love between us and the divine. That what we have is God's gifts to us. I talk about our abilities, interests, and resources. Ed, and then what we do with what we have, that can be our gift to the divine. So. Instead of worrying that I don't have enough, you see, what can I do with what I have? And that linking with the divine can happen through two ways. One is through our inner bhakti, we make a connection, that's immersive bhakti. And then with that stability coming from that inner connection, we act in the mode of service to make contributions. In this way, each one of us can infuse our life with meaning and purpose. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Is there any question or comment? In general, balance is dynamic. Sometimes we think for balance, no, I have a formula for my life. This time I do this, this time I do this, this time I do this, and my life will become balanced. Well, it's good to have some structure, but life itself is not always very structured. So if I'm riding a bike, then if I want to go straight, the balance state is the vertical state. But if the road is turning right, then I have to tilt the bike towards the right. That's how I'll keep staying on the road. But if after I have tilted the bike towards the right, if I keep it tilted, then I just go around in a circle. So then I have to bring it back straight again. And then maybe the road goes left, because I want to go in that direction. Then okay, then again I tilt the bike towards the left. So like that, once we have that this is the direction I want to go. Then, whether to tilt the bike left or tilt the bike right, that we can get a sense of that. So similarly for us, overall we want to grow as human beings and ultimately grow in our relationship with the divine. And we can, if we talk specifically about our spiritual consciousness, and our consciousness growth can happen in two ways. We can grow deeper and we can grow broader. So expansion of consciousness. So deeper means within we understand that there are more layers of reality to my existence. And then we reach the spiritual core of who we are. But when our consciousness grows broader, that time 
we, we start appreciating people more, we become more empathic. So we may at different times need different things. And both are growth. So both, as I said, they both are contributing to the expansion of consciousness. So some people might be very, very serious about their spiritual practices. And then they are trying to connect internally. But then they come off as very insensitive and rude and uncaring, apathetic towards the world. So that connection is not really warming their heart to others. That is not a very balanced group. On the other hand, somebody may have a lot of mood of contribution. Oh, I want to do this for you, I want to do this for you, I want to do that for you. But then, after some time, they basically start feeling lost. They start feeling, okay, you know, what am I doing? In saying yes to everyone else, have I ended up saying no to myself? Have I lost myself in the process? So essentially, I would say, the, the test that we are losing balance is that we start feeling a drop in meaning. Does this really matter? Does this really count? So if we start feeling that what I'm doing is valueless, or it isn't, it can be. To feel that it is valueless, it's, it's quite drastic. But even if it is, we start feeling that it values less. Both ways. We start, I mean, does this really matter? This seemed so important for me six months ago, one year ago. Why is it that this doesn't seem to be of value? Maybe it is still of value, but it is taking us away from something else of value. And that's why we think this is a word. So generally, if we start feeling a drop in meaning, does this really count? Does this really matter? That means we are doing something less or something too much. Does that answer your question? Yes, please. Um, today, after the food, uh, we were talking about uh, non-duality. <coughs> uh, does it make sense uh, to rest in non-duality, or do we need the duality de to develop? Uh, what exactly are you meaning by non-duality and duality? Uh, like, to does it have to be a moment to have a choice, or is it just? Okay, to rest in the middle of the storm and not to go into that uh, whether there was a mistake or not, and then after the process of value or whether less. Did you get my point? Okay, let me re-articulate that when things are stormy around us, at that time, do we try to just find the, say, the eye of the storm and do we try to come to rest? accepting the situation and accepting that things are moving in the right direction ultimately or do we analyze the situation maybe okay, this person i did something wrong maybe that person did something wrong no, it's, and more, it's more about do we need um, the situation uh, do we need the situation to develop or is it okay to just stay on the like you say we are feeling the movement of the bike, whether left or right. Uh, what if we just like relax on the bike without that we have to take a decision uh, to drive somewhere? Like okay. So if you relax on the bike without, I think I've got your point broadly speaking. <coughs> in general, in life, acceptance is important. If there is constant emphasis, you know, I want to change this, I want to change this, I want to change this. Sometimes we may want to change the world and that's too difficult to do. Sometimes we want to change ourselves and sometimes even that is too difficult to do. <laughs> so, you know, just as we have to accept the world, we also have to learn to accept ourselves. So accept that things are moving properly, are moving, moving in a reasonable way. But while there is acceptance, that's not the only thing that is important. Because we have been innately given a sense of agency. So the idea is that there is, there is acceptance of the situation, or you could say, <coughs> generally when you talk about acceptance, 
there are in a situation small things and then there are big things for us so for example say right now you are sitting for this talk and maybe you are interested in learning or seeing yoga wisdom and the way you are sitting with the chairs are not comfortable the floor is not floor is not so comfortable and you know this talk is not going to go on for 6 hours so okay maybe for 10 15 minutes i can sit on this sit on the floor i don't have to just uh, let that may have said dwell on that discomfort too much so that that's a small thing relatively speaking so you can accept it so that you can focus on the big thing the focus on the big thing is okay let me learn something out here so in general in every situation we need to accept some things but say for example right now you are sitting over there and say a person is sitting next to you and that person is talking on the phone with you now uh, should you accept that situation well you know if you come here come here to hear the talk to learn something and if somebody is interfering with that you don't have to yell at that person you don't have to bad mouth the person right then you can move somewhere else <coughs> so there are small things which we can accept but we all need to have big things in our life and for those big things we need to accept the responsibility to move towards those things so like you can say the same by example yeah we could be relaxing on the bike but then overall we take the responsibility of riding the bike now depending on the road we may operate differently so there is if we don't accept the small things then we will constantly be irritated but some people they have such a bright disposition that as soon as they enter a room they suck away all the light and energy from it is it so that's not a bright it's a very dark disposition they're constantly irritated about every small thing in life so <clears throat> if we can't accept small things then that would be will be constantly irritable that's bad but if we accept bad things also sorry accept big things that means something important for us we don't try to change that also then we will become very passive we will become dysfunctional we will not be able to do anything at all so if we can't accept small things we will become irritable we accept bad things we will become passive mm-hmm. but when we okay i'll accept the small things so that i can focus on the big things that is when we will be able to be progressive so in every situation say if i am in a job and my boss is unpleasant now okay but you know the pay is good the work is something which i like i want to grow in this career this particular field okay but the boss being a little rude or disagreeable it's a small thing so i accept that and to focus on big things so that is when we will be i could say progressive i'm not using progressive in a political sense over here progress means on the path of progress zan si question thank you any other questions yes please hi um i grew up in israel and i feel like in israel you have a lot of shells growing up that you need to break um like facing enemies and economy and all kinds of things yeah but i feel that a really growing like these are the people really quickly when we're already young to face a lot of things and to find the really big purpose really soon um so it kind of gives you direction when you're young and like in the self place it gives you a lot of meaning but at the end i also feel like everything we want is peace and love and happiness and for it. like to solve all these these things and not to, for them to keep on going But the question that has been like bothering me since I came to Australia or I see it maybe Australians won't feel the same but as a place that doesn't have many enemies and has a lot of land and good economy and like all you know like is pretty good here 
I think it's much harder to find a purpose and meaning because you're not in survival anymore. You're past these things and like you can start building farther from there, but then you don't know where to go because all of a sudden, you, you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a question that I've been asking myself, like you work so hard and you have purpose and you build like really strong people, but at the end, like on the higher part of things, you wish to not need to work for these things and to have a good society and a peaceful place to, that everyone loves everyone. So just like, I don't know if it's a question, but just like something. Yeah, it's a very valid point. In India, a lot of Indians admire Israel. Because India is also in some ways a situation somewhat similar. Not that dire. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely. So, let me re-articulate the question as I understood it. That when we are in a situation of existential threat or danger, that when we means we as a community or we as a country, then that itself gives a overarching purpose to everyone over there. And that leads people to grow, to progress, to flourish. But the idea of flourishing is you want to come to a place where we won't have to struggle. We won't have, but when we come to a place like that, sometimes we find that you come there and then that's where it seems that people lose a sense of purpose. So why does this happen? Or what can, what can be done about it? Okay, so. It's a serious uh, concern and in general, you could say that as I talked about this purpose, I talked about in, for universal purpose and individual purpose or personal purpose. You could put it in two different terms also. You could talk about it as a collective purpose and more of an individual purpose. So some societies are centered on a much more collective ethos than an individual ethos. So India, China to some extent, they're, they're very family and community centered. So in one sense, the whole that you belong to, that defines your purpose. And India was also to some extent like that till maybe 30, 40 years after the independence and before independence. And even now it's like that. So, so now the, there's the advantage of a collectively driven purpose. That is, that is, one doesn't have a sense of purposelessness. It's like a ready, ready purpose is available. One doesn't have to find or discover a purpose. It's already there. That's the positive of this. But the negative of this can be, one can feel a lack of autonomy. No, I've been told to do this. I don't have any freedom. And sometimes that can become a little, little restrictive for people. Now, on the other hand, when there's there's individual purpose, well, when society is more or less arranged in such a way that society's basic functioning is taken care of, and society does not give a person a role directly for themselves. So the positive of that is, there is a great room for self-expression. Which is a positive. But the negative is, that not everybody can actually function with that level of complete autonomy. That can actually lead to directionlessness. So, one of my services is writing. I have written several books. So it's uh, it's it's been there are uh, there's a lot of study done with respect to authors. Authors are creative people, so generally they need their space. But at the same time, some authors work best when they have a deadline. Okay, this is the time by which you have to produce. It may not be best quality, but at least something will come out. Some authors, as soon as you give them a deadline, <coughs> their creativity goes dead. They feel it. Forget a deadline. Will come in when it was, when it, when it is going to come. Now, which is better? Well, it's not a question of which is better, which works better for the individual. So that's why it's a 
it, there has to be like a negotiation between the individual and community. Right? Especially in a society where, uh, where um, the basic needs are taken care of. Then individuals need to be not only encouraged, but also educated. Not that this is your purpose, but this is how you find a purpose for yourself. Otherwise, the it, otherwise, it's like, okay, you go in the big world and do what you want. You know, what I want? What do I want? I don't even know what I want. See, it's like in a class. Sometimes some students speak the loudest. But just because the students speak the loudest doesn't mean they are the brightest. Isn't it? The teacher asks a question, one student will always answer. And it's the wrong answer. <laughs> so like that, inside us, there are some of our loudest desires. But our loudest desires may not be our brightest desires. Isn't it? So when we have complete autonomy, sometimes we may choose suboptimal purposes. And then we may start dissipating our life. So, that's why I think in the, especially the parts of the world where there is, uh, where there basically are taken care of, there is an upsurge of spirituality, of conscious living. But people are looking. People are looking for more, something which gives meaning. And I would say that's a very positive sign. So where, so where, 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 where social structure is more, the people find meaning more in religion. Okay, do this, do this, do this. But where the so collective meaning is not there, there people find more. I want, I want some more spirituality. And now religion is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be if it becomes narrow-minded. Religion is more associated with structures, and this is how you grow. Spirituality is more of you know. Okay, I want to explore. I want to analyze. I want to find out. Which is good. It's only. But. Uh, if those those areas are not there, then it can become like an abyss. It can in which people can sink. So I'd say that uh, it, all of you have got some experience over here. Some of you may may wish to explore more. Some of you want to continue on your exploration of on your. Some may explore this more. Some may want to explore more. Whatever it is, or whatever higher consciousness you are developed. You can also become agents for inspiring others to explore higher consciousness. And that way we all can make some small difference. Okay? So good, good, good observation actually. Thank you. Any last question or comment before we stop? Yes, please. I had a personal curious question for you. Um, how would you define your own personal purpose and did that come from a moment of also meaning for you? Okay, how do I define my purpose? Mm -hmm. Let's say mm, three stages of, you could say in that my growth. One was, and if you may notice that I need touches for walking. So when I was one, I got polio. So it was, uh, I don't, I was walking normally and I just fell down and I just couldn't walk anymore. I don't remember that. My mother told me about it. But my, uh, one of my earliest memories is that uh, maybe some neighbors or relatives had come to our home. I don't know how, I, I was two or three or whatever. It's vague. And my mother is no more so I can't ask her about it. But I remember some neighbors were consoling, oh, oh it's so sad that your child has got, your son has got polio. I was her first son. And she was, I remember she said in a very gallant voice. Just whatever he lacks physically, God will provide him intellectually. So I don't know whether I had shown some signs of high intelligence or whatever. I don't know why my mother said that. <laughs> yeah. But from that point onwards, somehow, subconsciously or consciously, I started identifying myself much more with my intellect than with my physical self. So as while well I was growing up, I couldn't play like other kids. But I loved to read books, I loved to think. I had some friends with whom I would discuss a lot of things. And I grew in that dimension quite a bit. So uh, the, the physical aspect, it didn't really define me much. When somebody sees me, that the first thing they say is that I need, I'm using crutches. 
But for me, my crutches are like my glasses. You know, I can't see without my glasses. But you know, I don't think much about it. Just put on the glasses and keep, go out with life. Either pick up the crutches and go on with life. So that, the basic, that my purpose would have something with the intellectual side. Mm -hmm. That was, I think, it came right from my childhood. And the second was, as I was growing, I, I both, I loved my teachers and my teachers hated me. Not hated. <laughs> it is like, I liked my teachers because I saw them as giving so much wisdom, but I would ask them a lot of questions. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> and often they would get annoyed. And sometimes... Are you annoyed? <laughs> I'm trying to be a better teacher. <laughs> Sorry? I said thank you for sharing. So, but I somehow developed this faith that education can be very transformative. I was quite inspired by some of my teachers. So I had that sense growing up that you know I was going to use my intelligence to provide some kind of education that would make a difference in others' lives. So right in my school itself, I would uh, help other kids who were not so good at studies. By God's grace, I was fairly good at studies. And then when I was studying my engineering, I joined a social welfare organization, uh, which was also into education. So I would go to an underprivileged area in near my college and would offer free tuitions to the kids over there. Uh, English, history, math whatever they need. And I felt quite a deep satisfaction by doing that. But at the same time, as we became friend, I became friends with those kids, they started telling me about their homes and their lives. And I found many of them were from quite dysfunctional homes. No, it was not that they were, at that time in India, this was 1990s. There were not many broken families in India, but still there was Alcoholism, especially the parents, the fathers would drink alcohol and there's a bit of domestic violence. And I started thinking at that time, how much difference am I really making for these children's lives if their, their homes are so dysfunctional? So then I talked with the organizers of that social media organization and we decided to diversify into anti-alcohol kind of campaigning. So we got some specialists to come and do talks. We also learned some things. And we inspired, it was, a, it was a small part of that underprivileged area. In India, we call them slums. That call, that part of the slum, after a few months of our endeavors, everybody there resolved, to all the when all the parents, they said, we'll give up alcohol. And we considered that to be a great success. But then, I had gone, I think, for my summer vacation, something to my home. When I came back, I found that something tragic had happened. For me, it was tragic. I had invested a lot of meaning in that. So basically, there had been some local municipality elections. And one of the candidates, in order to woo the voters, had brought several truckloads of free alcohol for everyone. And not only the parents, but even the kids are drunk. Mm -hmm. And that's the time I started thinking that through education, I'm trying to open doors for people. And education does open many doors. But I felt it's almost like inside people, there are some trap doors. And they, they're going on some path in life and the trap door seems to open and they fall. So unless those trap doors can be closed, will we be really making a constructive difference in people's lives? So that's when I started, my reading started becoming more psychological, philosophical, trying to understand what goes on inside us. And that's when I read the Bhagavad Gita, I learned about yoga and especially Bhakti Yoga. I found it very rational and transformational. Uh, since my in teens, early teens, I had some anger issues. My friend here reminds me I still have anger issues. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, 
they are, they are substantially lesser. So when I started practicing Bhakti Yoga, the, I found that within, within a few weeks, my anger went down substantially. Issues which would have really made me yell at others previously, I would be able to navigate much more calm. One of my close friends was getting into alcohol. We were in a top engineering college. All of us were good students overall, but he was just through some bad influences going down. And he was trying to stop, he couldn't stop. But he started studying the Bhagavad Gita, practicing mantra meditation. And just gave it up completely. Uh, was able to break free from the shackle of that unhealthy habit. And that's when I felt that this wisdom really has a lot of power in it. And uh, during my college itself, I started talking about Bhagavad Gita with some friends in small study groups. And after I finished my engineering, I was studying, I was working in a multinational software company. And at the same time, in the evenings, I would go to some of the colleges and give some small talks to small study groups. So one evening, I had a talk in one of the colleges, in one of the hostels in the colleges. But then my boss told me that we have an urgent project deadline. You have to stay on at a late night today. I said, I can, I'll come back early, come early in the morning tomorrow and work. He said, no, we have to finish it to write itself. So I tried to arrange some other speaker and just couldn't arrange anyone. And I had to cancel a program. That night late when I was coming back, I was thinking, you know, if I am not writing these software programs, there are probably a thousand other people who are equally if not better, equally good if not better than me, who could write these programs to do this coding. But if I am not sharing spiritual wisdom, then how many other people are there who can do that? So that's when I felt, I felt not just an inspiration, but also a deep conviction that this is what I should be doing. So that was about 20, 25, 24 years ago. So, 20, 26 years ago, actually. So that's what I've been doing. Since then, trying to learn spiritual wisdom and also learn how to share the spiritual wisdom. So I would say, using the intelligence, using the intelligence for educational purpose, and using the education intelligence for education about spiritual wisdom. So those were the three stages by which I found my purpose to some extent. But still, it's I say purpose is an evolving process. So I keep learning. Thank you. So, thank you very much for your participation and attention. Wish you all the very best on your personal spiritual journeys towards creating a new purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, as I mentioned, I have written a few books. So, this is one of my latest books. You are not your mind. You are better. <laughs> <laughs> this is 64 reflections on mind management. Each of them is just one is an article of just two pages, and there are some illustrative diagrams explaining the concept. Like I was drawing simple outlines. These address question: What exactly is the mind? Why does our mind tend to gravitate toward negative things? What creates the impressions in the mind? How can we change those impressions? If our mind doesn't cooperate with us, then do we have to use willpower alone or are there other strategies? How does spirituality help in transforming our mind? So questions like these are answered in this book. If any of you would like to have, I'm available for signing the book also. And this is, this is a calendar with 365 quotes inspired by the Bhagavad Gita. The truth may be bitter, but it doesn't have to be spoken bitterly. <laughs> this is those who open their mouth without opening their mind end up eating their words. <laughs> so, be mindful or your mind will make you a fool. So, each of these is like a quote inspired by one man words from the Bhagavad Gita. This is like a quick dose of a spiritual wisdom that you can access maybe early morning of the day. Or you can even keep it at your, at your home reception or workplace desk. And then you can, if your colleagues or friends or guests come and see 
a quote that can inspire a more meaningful discussion with them. So both of these are available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, one more thing, I've, I've spoken the Bhagavad Gita, if any of you are interested in learning the Bhagavad Gita a little bit more, I do a daily podcast of about 25 minutes. It's called Bhagavad Gita in a year. So if you just search on Google, we just started it a few months ago, uh, about a month ago. So every day we take, the Bhagavad Gita is a text has 700 verses. So every day take, we take one or two or three texts. And with a couple of friends, we have a discussion. So you just search on YouTube for Bhagavad Gita in a year. And my name is Chaitanya Charan. Search for that, you can find it, and that's an online resource for continuing your learning if you like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.